So um, today I'm going to talk about five uh, different steps that I took to build Albert's List. And so Albert's List, um, as you may or may not have read through the Meetup group, is a community that I founded on Facebook uh, several years ago, uh, back in 2013, to really help people do a better job at finding work, accelerate their job hunting opportunities, and connect with the right resources around both the Bay Area and beyond so that they can feel like uh, they're in a better spot professionally. And so today, yeah, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about me uh, go into uh, what Albert's List is, uh, and then go into five tips, and then do Q&A. And so for those of you who are on the live stream as well, uh, if you have any questions, and for those who are also here live, uh, I can answer them as they go along too. So uh, we can make this a, a very um, <clears throat> casual conversation about uh, what you can do if you're looking to build a Facebook community uh, that looks a little bit like mine. So uh, I uh, don't actually run Albert's List as my main full-time job. I'm a marketing manager for a technology consulting firm, and we do uh, consulting for a lot of Fortune 500 companies, and I'm a marketing manager by day, uh, doing a lot of content and sales support and things like that. Um, Albert's List is something that I founded back in March of 2013, and we've grown it to about 25,000 members with uh, groups not only in the Bay Area, but also Southern California, Seattle, Austin, New York City, Chicago, as well as some inspired groups out in Florida, as well as Barcelona. And so members from this group have been hired at companies like uh, GoPro, Cisco, Twitter, uh, and some lesser known companies as well. <coughs> So uh, the photo that you see in the back here is uh, really the impetus for the beginning of Albert's List. Uh, this is graduation from, for me uh, from college back in June of 2010. And uh, this was a significantly different version of me. It was a very entitled version, a person who didn't quite know what to expect from the real world. And uh, two days later, after this picture was taken, it would be the Monday after graduation where I would sit in my apartment and start my first uh, stay-at-home, work-at-home job and wonder how I got there. And I got there because I had failed some interviews that I had gone to. Um, one notable company that I was at, I sat in an interview on campus and you know, I thought about how, uh, how, wh how I would be benefited from the job, from the salary to the laptop that I would get to all those things. And so I put myself in this situation. And, you know, it was really the end of the recession still at that time, and it was really tough for anyone to get a job, especially difficult for new graduates. And the months that uh, came after this, I was just thinking about, you know, even though I had a job and I was getting more opportunities and more opportunities, how could I also continue to help the people that were still struggling? Uh, the Monday after graduation, I had actually jumped on my company's, my, not my company, but my university's LinkedIn page, and I had asked for help. Like, how do I figure out this post-graduation, post-job thing? And so one of, uh, one of my fellow alumni called me and said that you need to start networking. And that actually lit something under me because it eventually led to Albert's List where we are today. And so, you know, as I've built this community from zero to 25,000 plus, uh, the next couple of slides I'm going to discuss sort of some philosophies and some overarching um, intentions that I want to set for today. Because, you know, community is a really interesting, spiritual, connected concept. Um, I know that we all come in here looking for the professional aspect of it, but I think there's also a very new agey feel to it too, because uh, when especially you are tied to your community and your community feels like it's di benefiting directly from you and you from it, um, it really creates your, it really turns your ability to creating, in the, creating a community that really benefits uh, the world at large. And so here are some of the things that I have discovered that are very high level, and we'll jump into each of these a little bit in more detail. <clears throat> so the first one that I have is that community is personal. Uh, for me, when I started Albert's List, it was actually a couple of years after I had started this Excel spreadsheet full of recruiters, and I had forwarded lots of emails, and I had posted status updates in between people's Instagram food pictures of job opportunities and uh, networking events. And 
I decided to start a community because uh, it was it either came down to that or a brand page, and I felt like I wanted something a little bit more exclusive, right? All of our job searches are really personal, especially for the ones in here who are looking for a job today. Um, you feel like the day after day you're looking for work and you're trying to figure out what fits and what you're trying to and who you're going to get along with and what company is going to be one that's for you. And so if you build a community around that, like a job search community, you quickly begin and realize that you're not alone and your story is something that's shared by a lot of people. And for a topic especially like job hunting, if you don't make it personal, then a lot of people may not relate and they might just come for your job listings and nothing more. <clears throat> the, second, uh, the second philosophy that I've really discovered over the last couple of years as I think about building a community is that you really become a provider for the people that spend time with you. Uh, every time somebody posts something to my group or every time I have a conversation with a service provider or a business, I always think about, you know, how would the new student who just graduated into the real world benefit? How would the seasoned professional benefit? Or how would the recruiter benefit? And would these people still coming come to this group if this thing was still offered? And so kind of in line with protecting your community, you have to be able to think about how your members will perceive you because there are thousands and thousands of communities out there. My job search community is not the only job search community out there. And in fact, it's actually not the biggest. Uh, Bay Area Jobs and Internships has something like 65,000. But a lot of people flock over to mine because I would say there's a sense of protectionism. There's a sense of culture, which actually is the next one. Uh, you lead by culture. So because I've had a very interesting job hunt story, gotten laid off three times in seven years, I've driven a lot of managers crazy, and I figured out a lot of this job hunting thing on my own uh, because I decided to do something completely different from my parents. Uh, my parents were software engineers in Silicon Valley for 30 plus years, and I work in marketing. And so even though I'm kind of in, a, in, the, in the same industry as them, I do a lot of very different work. and. Really, for the first couple of years, I had to do a lot of exploring. I had to talk to a lot of mentors, a lot of career coaches. I had to get fired a couple times, get laid off. And I lead by the culture of what you're about to go through here in this group is something that everyone here has, for the most part, experienced in their lives. And that if you have something to share, if you want to be vulnerable, we are going to be here for you. We're going to listen to you. We're going to encourage you. And if you're looking to save yourself from whatever calamity that you're trying to save yourself from in the job search, then we will, help, we will step up and we will see whatever resources are out there, give you the ideas. Kind of like, I guess, teaching a man how to fish. We're kind of like that big lake. And so if you're willing to learn how to fish, you can come to Albert's List and we'll show you how. And so the final one that I think that uh, is really important with Albert's List is the facilitation of connection. So some of you here are, today, are here today because you actually found this through Albert's List. And one thing that we do on Albert's List all the time is that we like to tag the names of members in the group for job listings, for events, for people who introduce themselves. Because at the end of the day, we realize that you know, if we just let everyone out, let everyone to their devices, then maybe things wouldn't happen. But we have created really great connections within the group where people have now become each other's mentors. They network together. They are friends. Then they go to and they watch each other's back when it comes to uh, each other's professional development. And when you're able to facilitate that, facilitate that connection and create that really great culture, that's when I think an online community becomes just as good as you know, taking it offline and people are able to meet each other in real life and continue the relationship that way. So with that, I'm going to get started with the first tip on uh, what it is about uh, social community. Um, OK, cool. Let me see. All right, so that's, uh, that's a statement. Cool. Um, so the first tip that I have for building social communities today is to get consistent with content. So I think we all know that marketers today that content is king and the way you distribute it is pretty much queen. 
in the sense that there's so much content to be created and content calendars to be followed that that's pretty much how uh, you get the party rolling. And so content gets the conversation started, whether it's in my group usually, it's job listings, it's advice that I create or other people create, it's motivation Monday, feel good Friday, things of that sort. And you try to do this on a consistent basis and you do it so that you can add value. So the types of content that we usually have in Albert's List are visual. So uh, lately we've done a lot of Facebook Live. We've done, we do videos quite a, quite, quite on a quite pretty consistent basis. So for example, every first Friday of the month, I do a readout of the Bureau of Labor Statistics jobs report. And I do it none other than to inform the members of my community where the economy is headed. Um, most people may not really give this a second thought. They may not think about it. But as the purveyor of this community, as the curator, it's important that you not only put out content, you put it out often, and you make sure that people can really gain some value from it because we also lay out the impact of how exactly this month's job report will influence your job search for the next quarter to come. Uh, in addition, you have text content, uh, so that's just your status updates, garden variety that you get on Facebook every day. Uh, third party content, which is uh, posts from other people. So we have about 80 plus recruiters in our group. We have a lot of hiring managers from a variety of companies. And sometimes they'll post. And we have people who want to ask for advice. And this advice is very wide ranging from asking about how to uh, get a raise to how to answer a certain interview question uh, to really everything in between. And then finally, it's going out and getting noticed. So one way that we've grown the group from zero to 25,000 over the last couple of years is just going on Twitter, at responding at people, uh, going out to networking events and sharing it with people. Uh, one of the ways that I knew that uh, I could get people interested early on in the group because we had it was to ask people if they wanted to contract for Google, you know, to, to drive the self-driving car. Um, we have recruiters from several staffing agencies who staff for that kind of role in my group. And that always gets people interested because most people kind of go through life thinking that they'll never work for a Google or they'll never work for a Facebook. And those opportunities are available in my group every single day uh, because the recruiters are there and you can make that direct connection and email them and you know, feel like you didn't have to send your resume into a dark hole and a dark portal because that's usually the problem with a lot of job hunting today where you're just sending it in and you're never hearing back. <clears throat> so content also drives action. Um, with regards to what you see on Albert's List and really how I create content on a regular basis, it's how do I get members, what do I want members to strive for? In an ideal world, I think I'd like every person on Albert's List, all 25,000, to be employed and working. Because I think that when people are all working, then we have a much more productive society, the economy is better, people are contributing. Um, how, should members, how should members interact? So uh, we want people to connect with each other. We often encourage people to go out and network uh, together at events. And we also encourage people to be kind to each other because job hunting is hard, people go crazy, and we want people to just respect each other's space and be nice to each other. And then finally, what are the expectations? So for example, uh, within my group, and we'll learn about this later when we come to rules, that we want people to treat each other as they would want to be treated. And we want people to contribute and give to other people so that they can receive. So really kind of like time-tested, age-old uh, concepts that we've all known since really young, a really young age. And you know, a lot of that actually plays out very well into community management. Um, content drives experience. So when people consume the content in my group, it actually comes out a couple ways. They go to an event, they apply for a job, they connect with someone, and then if their experience is positive, sometimes they will add their other friends. And I get this all the time, and I see it when people add their friends into the group where it looks like uh, somebody was added by so-and-so. And it's really a 
example of how social capital drives a lot of the experience in my group. So word of mouth drives new memberships, new members, whether it's through uh, events, whether it's through, uh, whether it's through somebody else getting a job, or really just in conversation. I am not in the conversations that everyone has about Albert's List, but from time to time I hear that people have shared uh, these experiences with their friends and their friends join up and their friends join up and sooner or later you have you know a 20th connection a 20th degree connection coming into the group and that's actually pretty cool um, the second part is that when it comes to content driving experience the customer is also king uh, so, for, so, in this ex so in this specific example, the community, man the community members in my group do drive a lot of how I want to run my community. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to a job search, a lot of really relevant topics uh, may not necessarily be relevant to me, but may be relevant to the audience. So if they want to hear more about resume writing, if they want to hear more about how to use social media to find a job, then it's, really, then it's really best that I listen to them because if I'm putting out content that they don't want to consume, they may not want to come back. And then uh, finally, what are the expectations here as well where people want to know when they come to Albert's List, are they going to definitely get a job? Are they going to get close to finding a job? Whichever one it is. And obviously, when it comes to my group, I tell people that I'm really grateful that they're here to come find a job because there are numerous locations out on the web, face to face in person, where one can land a job today. And the more grateful you are for your community members to join you for whatever topic that you're here for, because there's so much content online, the more that they may come back because they realize, you know what, this person knows that they aren't the only exclusive person here, and they're humble enough to admit it, and you know, I can come back because this person seems human. I think in the community space, and really, and maybe I've been thinking about this lately, especially on my long drives in Orange County in Southern California and that traffic, that in this world, we like to think about a lot of relative authority versus just authority in general. And in the community space, I like to think of myself as one of my own members because you know I'm not necessarily uh, a non-job seeker that has my own job through Albert's List. I also have a day job too. And so I'm not any different than a lot of the people there. And I try to make it, I try to give the impression that I'm that servant leader that's right there in the trenches, helping them find that job, helping them create that experience that's gonna help them come back. And I know this has worked because I've had people tell me that they log into Facebook just for Albert's List and they don't use it for anything else anymore, which is a real honor to hear actually. Um, cool. So, uh, so this is uh, this is a little bit of uh, an example of some of the pieces of content that I follow, uh, that I put up. So, Motivation Monday is uh, obviously a weekly post that I do around motivating our members to get their week started and do well in their job search, whichever it might be. Uh, Follow Friday is actually adapted from something that we see on Twitter. And so this is where I give people the opportunity to kind of do speed networking within one thread. And people post their LinkedIn profiles. Uh, they go ahead and uh, connect with each other. And within those sub-threads, now that Facebook has allowed for nested comments, I tag names of recruiters and people that people should know. And that just accelerates the process forward. So action items for your community, if you're just looking to start that. Um, the first one is discover what it is that you want to give to people. As a community manager, you're kind of that, uh, you're kind of that distributor. You're the person that's uh, there to uh, give away something that it is that is your gift, whatever it is that your purpose is that you want to give away a little bit of. Um, the second one is to figure out who your, who your member is. So when I started Albert's List, uh, it really was uh, more of a let's throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks because at very early on the intention was not necessarily to build it into the behemoth it was today as much as it was to just put job listings in a group because I had nowhere else to put them and see if people get some success out of it. And we had some really good early successes. I, I remember that maybe like the 15th member of my group ended up getting a job at IBM that she's still at today. And so, you know, um, a lot of happy accidents, but you know, I acknowledge those happy accidents as so. 
Uh, the third one is that to create a ca content calendar and experiment. So, you know, the content pieces that you see here with Motivation Monday and Follow Friday, you know, they kind of came about uh, maybe about a year and a half to two years ago. I really wasn't thinking about it. I noticed that a lot of other uh, companies who market stuff use it too. So I decided to put, put it to work too. And you know, it worked pretty well because I think people get tired of seeing job posts and bad news and all of that stuff all day, that they want something that'll lift them up or help them even further. And really the intention is to have them spend a lot of time in my group so they feel like they're on a job search and they feel like they're productive. And then finally, it's to find your voice. And so each and every one of us in here has our own voice when it comes to how we communicate and talk to our community. And so when it comes to finding your voice, it's how you want to communicate whatever it is that you want to see that change in your world. Uh, did you have a question? Oh, OK. I thought I saw you raise your hand. Um, and so for me, it's something that's, uh, I'm a really official sounding person. So I try to be, as I would say, amicable with people in my group as possible. And the intention really is to, uh, you know, give people an aura of, and not really an aura so much as much as it's literal, a literal feeling of safety, where it's like, you're here, you're on this job search, I want to take care of you, and hopefully 24,999 of my friends will try and take care of you too. And so we strive for that every single day in creating that culture. And so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's really step one there, content. Uh, step two is to create internal leaders. And so this one's a little interesting because I think that uh, one thing that I've noticed in my community over the last couple of years, and one thing that you may notice in the communities that you build, is that when you bring a bunch of people together, there are people who will be eager to help you grow, especially when you have social capital. And so one example was the other week. So um, this is a member of my community. She's been there for a while. And she decided that she wanted to do a women's networking event. She didn't really reach out to me for it. I approved it because, you know, hey, networking's a great thing. Uh, we can all strive to connect with each other a little bit better. And so something that I don't think she expected to turn into much ended up becoming an 88, 90 like, 79 comment post with people saying that they wanted this really, really badly. And for a while, you know, I've always wanted to do a networking event in, uh, in San Francisco, but I don't live here. And so the opportunities for that are very sparse. And so uh, one thing turns into another. We get a venue. We turn on a Facebook event. And before we knew it, we had a whole entire women's event with 30 people, I think, were here. And so I, I, I didn't necessarily leave the charge on this, but I gave someone else the ability to. And I, I've, I've learned throughout the years in my community that when you give people the chance to rise up and do their best and do what they're good at or find their purpose within your purpose, uh, they can be very successful because they see your vision, they understand your vision, your vision has been clearly articulated and it turns into really, really wonderful things like this. And you know, we're gonna, be, we're gonna apparently start doing this every month and we're gonna start partnering up and do them in the South Bay and uh, really, you know, part of my vision about this is I wanna connect as many people as possible because you know, a lot of us feel lonely in the job search. We feel like we have to go it on our own and struggle through everything and get hounded in our interviews and feel like we've been indicted for our lack of something. And you know, it's communities like this where people can sit around and you know, I've, I've heard some feedback from the people who were at this event who said that they had very deep, intense conversations about where they were in their career and especially particularly as women. Uh, who I know go through their own set of challenges when it comes to working in tech. And it's all about creating the space. And so part of it has to also do with taking your group offline, which I'll talk about as my fifth tip. And so, yeah, the points I'm making here is you offer opportunities for your members to grow. Uh, I know that everything that we do these days within our career can be counted as a sort of career thing. I know for me, uh, Albert's List is on my resume, and it's always an interview question. Uh, even though it may not relate to the job that I have at hand, people are, are going to ask because nobody, nobody really goes out and spends time to build a 25,000 $25, member uh, Facebook group around helping other people find jobs unless there was some other like you know intrinsic interest to it, which for me, it's, I'm, I'm 
still trying to figure that part out. I just like to help people. So uh, that's the first part. Uh, social proof goes a long way uh, is my second point for you know, offering opportunities to grow. When you grow your community to a large enough amount, people are going to notice. They're going to see that, oh, you know, so-and-so is capable of building a community up to a certain level. Uh, whether you have like 500 or 25,000, it shows that there's some level of interest and that uh, you, know, you can give them opportunities to grow by allowing them to have their own uh, sort of benefit to it. And you know, that's however you want to say it for uh, the people that you're going to work with. And so for me, as long as people keep it to the people who work with me, such as Mabel over here, to networking and connecting with people, then I'm okay with that. Uh, and then finally, uh, you involve the people in your community who may have the greatest impact. So for me, um, we have our over 80 recruiters in our group, and you know we try to involve them in the conversation when we can. I know that recruiters are very busy people, uh, but I know they're very powerful people too because they have the inside knowledge on where the job market is going, on what's what's happening, and uh, when they have questions such as you know I think earlier this week we had a member ask about entry level jobs, and I tagged a couple of recruiters and they provided some of their insight, and you know it's instant gratification to some sorts because you really really get to hear from the experts what an entry-level job really means. Um, so the third tip that I want to talk about is to encourage an actionable culture. And so tip two and three are kind of tied together, and so that's why I don't have an uh, action item slide for this one. And encouraging an actionable culture might be one of my favorite ones because I think this was probably the most unintended happy accident that happened for Albert's List, is that a group that I wanted to start that uh, originally began with just me dumping job posts became a place where I've actually met some really cool people who have become what I would consider to be lifelong friends. And I don't think necessarily there's a recipe to this, but uh, because you know every person's different in how they manage a community, but it's definitely an important tip to consider because this is what gets people to come and come back. So what is culture? Uh, in my opinion, culture is a set of values that you stand by. Mine is, for this one specifically, helping other people. It's to serve others and be that servant leader and to give people the power of opportunity through attention. Uh, by being able to post on Facebook in a group with a large audience of people and get the eyeballs of a lot of people who can potentially help you. Uh, the second one is to uh, ha roll individual personalities into one, uh, where you really get people to get on board with what it is that your vision is. And you don't necessarily need to state your vision all the time, you just need to go ahead and work with and lead with it. So I am pretty much involved in every single post that goes on in my community. And I either like it or comment it or uh, you know, do something with it. And that I think starts, that I think gives people um, a sort of a taste of the culture because they know that no matter what someone might say, one of the administrators, me or any of the three others that helped me is probably gonna see the post and either do something about it or you know, let it go. And we moderate our community very closely to ensure that people don't spam, people don't go after one another, and if they do, we try to take it to Messenger or we ban the, the offending person as quickly as possible. And so it's to create that level of safety where people feel like they can go to some corner of the web and feel like they're not going to be judged for something that they're not. Uh, the third one is interaction between community managers. And so for all of us community managers too, since there's four of us, we also talk on a regular basis to ensure that the best community is being created for those who are there. So how do you create culture? The first one I mentioned already was that you lead by example. So as kind of, uh, depending on the community that you build or that you're tasked to build, uh, you're going to take on the look and feel of the brand that you're working under, but it's also going to have a look and brand, look and feel that comes from you as well. Uh, so in this example, you know, you're going you're gonna to not only lead the community, but you're also going to build, oh, you're also going to uh, build your brand while doing it. And so, you know, be careful of what you say, be cognizant of who you are, and, you know, look at what kind of work, what kind of uh, content you create, because that's going to build a lot of the experience and the culture around your community as a whole. 
Uh, leverage your content calendar. We mentioned this already with things like your Motivation Monday and your Follow Fridays and the, uh, I guess, job search videos that I do every single first Friday of the month around the job support. Uh, your content will definitely be different if you're not running an employment group. But, you know, things of that sort that are similar. Um, third one is watch who you let in. So uh, we get at least 700 new members a month in our group, but I don't let everybody into my group because I realize some of these people may not necessarily add value, uh, especially since uh, I want it to be geographically relevant. So if somebody in my group is out in Virginia, for example, and my group is focused on the Bay Area, I may not necessarily be too interested in letting them in because they may not necessarily know what the challenges of the San Francisco Bay Area is. Uh, now, you know, every now and again, somebody may message me and they say, hey, I'm out in New York City, but I'm going to move to the Bay Area in November. And at that situation, I uh, go ahead and I... Uh, I, uh, I let them in. But in addition to that, right, when it comes to letting people in on Facebook, you want to know, like, how many days ago did they join Facebook? How many other groups are they in? Do they have any mutual friends with you? Do they already have friends in the group? Et cetera, et cetera. Because that will also show uh, whether they might be a spammer, whether they might be real, or uh, whether they're there to cause trouble, or whether they're legitimately looking for a job. Unfortunately, internet is not as innocent when it first started, so you have to kind of think about those things. Uh, and then, uh, you know, let your members lead. Uh, like I said that earlier, um, you have members who are in the community and who are here to uh, really get to know uh, what they really, really here to like help you too. So if you activate them to help you, then you can take your community a really long way. So uh, evaluation, evaluating membership, um, just mentioned that here, got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so welcome in fast and then always remove with caution. Uh, unless, the ca unless the removal is pretty obvious, whether it's somebody uh, you know, peddling sunglasses or selling their network marketing company or one of those. Um, but you know, in some cases, like earlier this week where we had somebody literally try to shame someone publicly in my group, we take those very seriously because it impedes on the experience that we're trying to create. And so you always want to evaluate who you're letting in and you know, don't ever be afraid to kick someone out if you feel like they're going to take away from your community experience. Uh, check in with your members. Ask how they're doing. Uh, Feel Good Friday is something I do from time to time because I know that uh, you know, really in this world where we live, this Instagram culture where everyone looks and feel, always looks like they're you know, on vacation and looking great, uh, you know, I want to know, like, you know, hey, maybe it's okay to not be okay today. And we all have job search troubles. We all go through hiccups in our careers. And I know we live in a country where our job seems to be everything. And while as unfortunate as that might be, I also want to create space for people to express themselves and share it. And so... Uh, then the final one is to connect others. So people join your group, you connect them to one another, and then you kind of let them be, and really great things can happen. So the next couple of slides I have are examples of culture creating posts that I would consider uh, have been in my group over the last couple of, uh, couple of months. So one thing that we always encourage for our group is when you get a job, whether it's through our group or not, we want to encourage you to share the wins as well as the struggles in our group. And so uh, this person is a personal friend of mine. He has been in retail forever. And he finally was able to get some opportunities outside of retail through some opportunities, through some postings in my group. And so, you know, he uh, got a lot of attention for it and a lot of, encourage, a lot of encouragement for it as well. And, you know, I encourage this because I think it gives people hope that if they might be struggling, seeing a story like this is enough to help them feel like, you know, they can go on for however much longer they need to go on to go find that job. And it also opens the opportunity for people to become their own thought leaders in my group, where it's like, hey, you found a job at company XYZ. Tell me how I can do that, too. And so it brings you extra networking opportunities. It brings you uh, more opportunities to connect with others. And uh, it also sells hope every day in my group. And that's, I think, a very important component of the job search, because the moment you lose that, your job search almost has the entire bottom fall out. Um, then there's you know, people who are willing to come in and just give. When you give, you lead by example. And so 
Uh, Christine here is a person who is looking to move out here from the, to the Bay Area, I think in October. She currently works in New York, and she just sees how the community is to each other every single day. And she's willing to step up, and she's willing to do her own leading, and she's willing to offer resume reviews. And so whether she charges for these or not, you know, I don't know. Uh, but I think that people are willing to uh, come in and, uh, and do these things, and it's really, really awesome because it's just, it just shows that people are on the lookout for each other. And so I'm really, really happy when I see these because that means I also don't have to do as much work. <laughs> um, and then there's you know my other favorite type of post, which is the job post. So uh, Zelina is a recruiter of ours at Aerotech if I see correctly here, yep, Aerotech, and she posts job listings, and we see these every single day in our group. And uh, the ones that I have circled here in red are friends tagging friends. And I think that's the one of the more special things here too, because people look out for each other. And this is a culture that I try to perpetuate as well, uh, where if I know that I have friends who are looking, then I tag their names, and I make themselves known, and I, uh, you know, hopefully they, hopefully they either get the job, are in consideration, or get more opportunities from it. And you know, we have tens of these every single day because there are a lot of jobs out there, and we've kind of cornered what I'd like to think the market on opportunity. So this is another one, one of the really good ones here. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing that I always find really refreshing and humble to have in my group is uh, the post where somebody comes in and, they, and, they're, and they're a little bit more vulnerable. So this person here uh, lost their job, I think, late last month uh, due to just downsizing and was, you know, getting unemployment uh, just a couple days ago. And, you know, she decided that she wanted to make a post about speaking to the EDD office. And, you know, this, this, uh, this post got quite a few comments because a lot of people also related to it. And we've had posts like this before where people uh, talk about how they were rejected from an interview or they're not sure where they're going in their life and they need help. And so, you know, we allow this too because it can be cathartic and we can allow people to really let themselves out and do it in an environment where they at least can feel like they won't be judged by other people. And we don't let people judge other people because, at least publicly, because, you know, it's everybody, everybody's got, uh, got something that they're going through and we want people to be, be good and be well. And so, uh, really, with all of the things that, uh, you know, we do in your communities, potentially, when you build them. It's, it's really about creating the type of culture that you want, whether it's the type of post where people share their success stories, the types of posts where people are being generous to fellow group members, the types of posts where there's opportunities, or informational posts or vulnerability posts, right? So, uh, these, these built out over time, and it all comes from how you decide to lead with the vision and the action that you want other people to take. And so action items for your community when it comes to creating your culture is number one, to understand your community purpose. I think when I first started in social media back in 2010, 2011, one of the things that I always wondered was, you know, people have a lot of followers, they're doing really well, they have all these likes and comments and everything. And that was back in the day when we were thinking about clout scores and our vanity metrics and all that stuff, and we still do to some effect. Uh, but, you know, you can really take your product, your community platform a whole lot further when you understand your purpose and when you know you're working towards something. And in my case, it's something that probably won't ever be attained, but having as many people hired as possible is a really, really great thought to have. Because I think when a lot of people are working, then they can focus on other things in their lives. Um, the next action item that I have is to vet your members. So you're only as good as maybe your weakest member, your least active member, your member who's just not engaged. Uh, and we have a lot of lurkers in our group, obviously for reasons where maybe they have coworkers and colleagues uh, that are in the group already and they just want to not post their introduction because maybe a colleague will notice and then they'll get fired. Um, but nonetheless, vet your members, let people in who deserve to be let in, and don't be afraid to remove people. 
Uh, and uh, don't be afraid to reprimand people for breaking your rules. We'll talk about rules here in a little bit. Choose vulnerability. So with all the posts that you just saw, uh, I think that, uh, you know, really there's a lot of uh, important, um, important feelings and thoughts that people want to put out there. When it comes to your community, no matter what topic it is, you want to give people the opportunity to have that space. I realize that as we uh, really move forth, you know, having this whole notion of space is important because it gives people the opportunity to express themselves. And that expression is an invaluable currency that I think builds a level of trust that no level of advertising can bring. And then finally, it's to find your voice. And so no matter what it is that your voice is in building you know, your community and how you want to portray yourself, uh, you can go ahead and create that and then refine it over time. So recapping everything here, culture starts with the top. Let your members feel and you know, be the most supportive person that you can be so that your community can thrive and attract like-minded people so that you can build your tribe and build your world. All right, so tip number four um, is setting the right rules. And so uh, this, is the part that, uh, this is the part that gets really interesting and really into the nitty gritty. So my community has an interesting challenge. Uh, from time to time, I will get a post from a female member who has somebody flirting with them over Messenger because they've invariably put up a job post and somebody thinks that it's an opening for a date. And, you know, it gets a lot of attention. This is 251 likes right here, reactions. And it's, it, it, it's funny. I laugh at it, too. Because it's like, okay, you know, people in this world don't understand their context and they think that you can get a date just about anywhere. And, 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 and like I was saying a little bit earlier, right, you want to create a community and you want to create a, an experience where people feel like they can come back to day after day and not feel like they're getting, uh, that, they're getting uh, that, they're, that they're going to be unsafe and uh, not want to post ever again. I think maybe that's my biggest fear after, you know, coming back to this topic over and over again is knowing that, you know, well, look, I have some people here who may not necessarily know their own context and they're chasing after things that don't need to be chased over here. Now, like, you know, if somebody met through my group and they started dating after the fact, I can't really control how humans interact with each other when they're not within the realm of the group and I'd feel happy for them. but. You know, if I get a private message from someone with a screenshot of a flirtatious message, then, you know, our rules pretty much state that you're banned on arrival. You're never going to come back into the group because if you're going to do it to one person, you may do it to them again. And, you know, I've banned a number of people from, from this before, and I will continue banning because I feel like it creates, uh, it, allow, it at least allows my members to know at the end of the day that I'm accountable for what happens here and the buck stops with me. And if the buck doesn't stop with me, then you know, they're gonna go to some other job, uh, jobs group. So you know, without governance, your community becomes the wild, wild west. Um, you know, it's kind of like the early days of the internet where there, were, there was really nothing going on as far as rules and how you coded things and you had wild GeoCities pages with rotating GIFs and musical backgrounds and flashing things and it really drove us all crazy for, those, for that time because, you know, there were no rules and, there were, and, and nobody was really dictating anything. Thankfully, now we're in 2017 and things are a little bit different, but if you decide to start your community and not think about the repercussions and consequences, uh, you too may face a community that runs rampant and needs to be controlled at least a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about developing guidelines. Your guidelines are probably going to be the most important part of the building of your community because it means that these are the standards that people are going to follow. It helps you monitor your corner of the web. It helps you maintain your community consistency. And it helps you develop standards for the rules of engagement. Um, and so my, uh, my, uh, the rules for Albert's list are actually fairly complicated. Uh, this is the pinned post that we have in our group. And it goes for about, I guess, about 2,000 more words here. 
And so we cover, we cover a variety of things within our group because we have a very specific set of uh, user personas. And so our user personas include service providers, recruiters, job seekers, uh, hiring managers, and then you know your run-of-the-mill people who are just here to network. And in particular, you know, we have rules around things such as how you promote yourself. Um, for example, a lot of people would love to come in and promote their protein shake, but we're just not going to let that happen because we want people to be uh, within a culture where they can buy or where they can engage and engage safely without feeling like they're being scammed. Uh, we have rules around how you engage with our recruiters because, you know, I know people can get very frustrated with the recruiters. Um, especially when they don't call back or when they have a bunch of other things on their mind and they're going through a billion things. And, you know, we, we have rules that are designed to uh, protect against our service providers and we let people know, you know, in the course of spending time in this group, you may be sold something and you may be marketed something that you can spend actual money on and you have the opportunity to either do it or not do it. And Albert's List assumes no liability for your purchase unless it gets into a legal realm. And thankfully, I haven't had to go to, law, go to court yet for it. And I hope that I never have to. Um, but it's pretty much spelled out. And this is kind of like the end user license agreement when you download something like iTunes. Um, when you join our group, it kind of Im I kind of imply that you've read the guidelines and these are the things that you ought to follow. And it's, it's really long. You know, it's, it, it takes you a good 15 to 20 minutes to read. But, uh, you know, it's all about covering your butt. Because if you don't cover your butt, somebody's going to try and sneak around it. And, you know, you never know what happens. And, you know, I'm updating these rules, uh, at least you see here, yeah, on a monthly basis. Because uh, new things are popping up all the time. New things I never considered. And I have to add them into, uh, I have to add them into the rules. Because if I don't, you know, it's just going to be more problems later down the road. And so I encourage you, all of you, to do that as you build your community as well. And, you know, the best members will follow these rules because they understand that they are part of something that is important to their lives. And, you know, unfortunately, I've had to ban people and they come back to me later and they're like, you know, I want to be let back in. And my answer to them is like, look, hanging out in my group is a privilege. And if you violate the culture of this community, then, you know, some people may not want to post or share their thoughts because of who you are. And, you know, I wish you the best of luck. There are plenty of other places you can go to out there. And I wish you, best, I wish you the best in your job search. And that's kind of it. And so you have to be really, like, I guess, official friendly, too, when people break these rules. Because people will break these rules. And, uh, and you'll have to, unfortunately, move on from some of your community members. So don't get too attached to your community members, either, because invariably somebody might actually break your trust and break your rules, too. So uh, as I said, you know, types of guidelines that we have, there are promotional guidelines, character guidelines, and interaction guidelines, I guess is the uh, three categories that I would place these into. And so consider how you want people to promote within your community, if that's something that you want them to do. Uh, consider how they should act towards each other, if that's something as well. And then uh, consider how they should, uh, they should be as people, too. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a complicated set of ideas and facets, but, uh, you know, you'll figure it out as you go along and as you build your community. Uh, what I have here is definitely not what I started with back when I built the community in 2013. Uh, I had like a really short, maybe four paragraphs when I first started the whole thing, and now it's practically an ebook. Um, so, yeah, you learn as you go along. So uh, just, you know, recapping this section, uh, you know, it's your world. Build it like you want it to see it so and cover your butt. Uh, guidelines build upon the culture. So how you build your guidelines will evolve as you build your community. And how you build your community will also affect the greater culture of how everything looks. Develop standards for how people should interact, whether it's uh, member to authority, authority to member, authority to authority. Uh, you know, all of those things matter because uh, you will invariably run into conflict and we'll have to deal with that. And then, you know, don't be afraid to boot. So if people are being bad in your group and people aren't doing what they're supposed to do, then kick them out. And uh, know that the decision that you make is ultimately going to be a good one. 
So with that one, we go to our final tip. And so our final tip is to get offline. So I know we're all about talking about online communities here, uh, but I think that the best type of community that you can build for yourself is one that is both online and offline. Because ultimately, we're here to build relationships, and there's nothing better than the relationship where you can sit across from someone at a table and break bread and get to know them after years and years of watching them post online. I know that uh, there have been members of my group that I've known for a long time. And, you know, just yesterday, actually, I met up with all three of, all three of them and, you know, all four of us were, you know, in the same pla place at once. And they had all been introduced off of Albert's List. And uh, they had become each other's mentors and best friends and confidants. And, you know, it was really cool to stand there and watch them all interact with each other because, uh, you know, it's just uh, something you never imagine. Uh, to happen on the internet, and it has. Um, you know, God bless community management, right? So uh, communication communities are not silos. Uh, just because you are online and just because you are uh, doing things online does not mean that you can shake it up every once in a while. And so value is created from ecosystems. What you do in your group is not only subject to your group and should also be taken to other resources as well. And maybe this is specifically an Albert's List thing because one thing that I'm always looking to do is to bring uh, separate parties from my life together. I've had the opportunity to uh, meet people from different walks of life who do different types of things. And I want to do my best in being able to bring these communities together so that people can derive the most value possible. And that actually comes from the very early uh, part of this presentation where I mentioned you always have your community in mind. So when it comes to having that new opportunity, that new idea, that new authority, that new program that you can introduce into the fold, you do it because people will learn that uh, it's an opportunity for them to be able to uh, experience something that's an extension of your group that may also further help whatever career aspiration or personal aspiration that they may have. So, you know, partner up with other organizations is one idea. Um, one thing that I did several years ago that you'll see on a slide here is I partnered up with a nonprofit organization that focuses on helping people how to code. And so we ran it a couple times, but it was really well attended because people were really interested in that kind of topic. And then, of course, extend your brand. So extend your brand, meaning doing things like this again where you're taking things offline where you're having little short meetups in cities far away. This is out in Fullerton in Southern California because I live there now, where you just bring people together and people meet each other. And then this is the coding, the coding, uh, the coding course that we had. And so at the end of the day, it's you know, partnering up and finding common vision and value between other organizations that are also interested too. Uh, and even, you know, for Albert's List, there's a lot of different jobs groups out there. But one thing that I strive to do is I try to help people understand that, you know, even though at the end of the day, there may be other job communities. So, for example, uh, in San Francisco, there's something called Hire Club. Hire Club is run by, I think, Katan Anjaria. I had lunch with him today. And, you know, we both run job communities where people post jobs, they post opportunities, they introduce themselves. And for me, you know, the real competition that we have against here today are outdated ideas around how you job hunt, um, things like, I guess, alumni college affinity where, you know, now you really can talk to anyone you want, and, you know, the war against unemployment. And those are the things I consider to be my competition because I want people to have a job because I know that jobs change everything. And so... It's opportunities such as you know all three of these that give people the chance to meet in person, connect, see someone that they've been seeing online for the longest time where they're posting content, and ultimately take that relationship offline. And who knows where it goes next, but at least you get people the chance to have that opportunity to meet up with each other and get to know each other. So action items for your community, you know. Um, be clear with your guidelines, be clear with what it is that you're looking to do. I guess that's from the last slide. Um, create partnerships, find organizations that can work alongside yours and expand the brand. So for example, on Albert's List, um, just this week uh, and last week when I posted this opportunity, for my members, it's an opportunity to come out and learn about 
not only job seeking, but also a different community track because community management is something that is still a relatively new career path and people are still learning about it. And I want people to have an opportunity to come and see what this is all about. Um, and so, you know, we'll share this live video into my group later because I think people should know. Uh, and, you know, because community management is also fun. Uh, and then, you know, get offline. So if you have the opportunity to create a, uh, create, create a networking event and get people together, uh, absolutely, I encourage it. And, you know, those are happy hours, those are speaking events, uh, those are uh, no host networking events. And so the more of that that you have, uh, the more opportunity you have to get people to uh, further extend how they interact with each other online too because they've met, they've spoken over the phone, or they've uh, they've been with each other at a uh, event, and that really uh, that really takes it up another notch. So uh, let's put it all all together. Um, there are five different things that we mentioned here today. So it's to create your content, encourage leaders, set your culture, build guidelines, get offline, and then you know what? Just keep repeating it. Do it over and over and over again, because the thing at the end of the day is uh, you know you grow it. You're all about growing your community to a larger and larger size, building that influence, connecting circles of influence, so that ultimately people can, uh, people can get what they need in order to add value to their lives. Um, other considerations. So I wanted to add this to the very end because, you know, building a community and building a business that wasn't intended to be a business from the start is always a really interesting idea. You know, like a lot of things that we do in our lives uh, start because we didn't expect them to start this way. When I founded Albert's List four years ago, four four years and a month ago. I didn't expect 25,000 people. I don't think I even expected 5,000 because I was just thinking, you know, I'm just going to dump job listings here and someone will benefit and maybe someone will share it and, you know, it'll be my nice little corner of the web. But, you know, 25,000 people later, um, if I were to start a community all over again, would I do it differently? The answer is yes. And so, uh, in addition to the five lessons that uh, you get today, I'm giving you a bonus. And so the bonus is, you know, if you want to grow your community faster, uh, use things like Facebook ads, advertising. Those are very helpful today because you can break it down by demographic. Um, supplement your community offline. So I probably would have created communities offline and gotten, uh, gotten that quicker as far as getting people to networking events and figuring that out. And then, you know, consider your revenue implications. So some of you are probably in here because your company believes that a social community is a critical part of the buyer's journey, especially in the B2B world where a lot of people are doing research and going to social communities is a key part of that research. And so for you, that might be, in, that might be building an app. It might be seeing where communities fit in your top, middle, and bottom of funnel uh, when it comes to your marketing journey. Uh, it may also be creating a web app where people can uh, get off of Facebook and you know go to your own proprietary platform so you don't feel like you're owned by the world's largest social network. Um, and so there's you know there's a lot of those considerations that I would have approached differently with a couple years ago. So in addition to these five uh, different uh, five five different tips that I offered today. Uh, there's also these additional tips here that I also want to put out there because I know that uh, building a community now in 2017 has uh, changed a lot different, is, is a lot different than when we did it back in you know 2011, 2012, uh, as far as tools are concerned, as far as analytics go, and so. Uh, you know, especially where a lot of people make money today doing e-commerce and such, and where Facebook keeps on changing its community's application, uh, you want to build those into how your community is uh, built as well. So, you know, this is a picture of Albert's List growth over the years. Um, uh, that little area from June of 2014 to December 14 where things really took off was actually where I brought in a second community manager and we started tweeting about ourselves on a, uh, on a really um, drip campaign basis. And that's where our community started really growing and you know, we started getting more members and people who uh, wanted to share our community with other people. So you know, everything that you see up here with this higher curve is really a product of 
a uh, is really a product of people also introducing their friends too. Um, I don't think I've added that many people to my group, but there are people who have added uh, nearly all their friends, and so uh, this just continues to keep going up as people discover the value, the culture, and everything that my community has to offer. So uh, with that, I've kind of come to the end. Um, my contact information is here. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes. Oh. Um, well, two sort of related questions. I'm assuming. OK. Um, I'm assuming that, well, we'll, we'll share. Okay, we'll share. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Judith, by the way. Pleasure Hello. to meet you. Nice to meet Love you, Love what too. you do with your community. Thank you. So I'm assuming that you don't have any costs, that there are no costs with Facebook, per se. No. But I know that there's a lot of time and commitment on your part. And I'm just curious how you're monetizing. Yeah, so uh, right now it's a lot of referral monetizing. So I have a couple of folks who I work in with my group who are career coaches, uh, who are recruiters, and for some of them who I've spoken them spoken with them, uh, they have told me that they're willing to give me a cut of their revenues. So uh, there's a little bit of that. And then we have a donate button that we never really promote, but it's there uh, if people really wanted to give back to the community as well. Great. Um, I just think there's such a really wonderful natural way that you have working with recruiters. I mean, I think you've really solved the big challenge, which is people need jobs, they have expectations of recruiters, which may not be you know, realistic because recruiters work for companies and not necessarily for individuals. But I think you've done a great job of sort of you know, um, threading that needle. Um, so I just wanted to really compliment you for the great work you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Test, test. Test, test. Oh, perfect. Now the doll will oh. Hi. Um, I co-moderate co a group on Facebook right now that's been doing really well, and mm -hmm. I'm happy to say doing many of the things that you talked about, Great. so I'm happy about that. And we are taking a, our first step offline, if you can call it that, because it's still going to be like web conferencing or phone mm -hmm. calls or something like that. Do, have you had any failures in that area where something that started online went offline and it didn't work? And what were the mistakes that you made and what would you do differently? I would say that webinars has always been kind of difficult. So one of the things that I like to do is bring in thought leaders and experts to talk to my community. And so live video is uh, really an evolving area of social networking these days that I think, um, I think jumped the gun a couple years ago with Periscope and Blab, which kind of didn't really do, I think, what people hoped that they would do. Uh, and then now there's BeLive.tv, which we use a lot in our group. And, you know, I think that, uh, I think that if I wanted to um, maybe, I guess, figure out that part over again. I think it probably would start with, I think, the video aspect of it, because I've always had a challenge in figuring out, like, you know, I want to be live. I want to tell people and show people in my community, um, like kind of that office hours mentality. But, uh, you know, it's really difficult to do that, because that kind of content hasn't yet come. And I guess that's something I probably would, I, I don't necessarily think I would be able to do it over again. But it's something that I wish could have come sooner, I guess, is what I'm thinking. I've had a lot of luck, not in this particular group, but in general mm. with Zoom. Zoom, yeah. Zoom has been solving a lot of my problems in terms mm -hmm. of being able to interact with 9, 12, 15 people at the same time. Mm. Okay. Um, and be able to see their faces clearly, to be able to hear them clearly, to mm -hmm. know who's talking. If you're interrupting someone, you see that on your screen. <laughs> um, and you can only do one-on-one -on -one calls for free at this point. I think you can do group yeah. calls up to 40 minutes. Okay. But I'm trying to take it advantage of that as much as I can before we get to this point so that if someone really wants to pay for us to have that account we could have that as a group as a shared expense of people who are you know uh, willing to go offline so 
off ish line. Yeah. Offline ish. I think my other I think my other thing that I probably would do over again is probably the mindset. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, I really created this group with the intention of dumping jobs and I never imagined, you know, twenty five thousand, much less like five thousand. And so if I thought about this at like three thousand members, you know, maybe I would have thought about um working with recruiters to get like a sponsorship from a staffing agency or getting a cut of, you know, somebody who's hired. Yeah, I had somebody from my group the other day, uh, they had moved from a contract staffing agency to in-house and they had messaged me because in our pinned, uh, pinned rules post, uh, we have a running list of recruiters and where they work. And he had told me, you know, 10% of my placements were from Albert's list. And you know, 10% is a pretty high number. Um, and I'm just thinking, okay, I probably left a lot of money on the table <laughs> if I wanted to do a cut. And so I think if revenue is your goal, because I know that in the case of community, revenue is not always the goal, uh, because sometimes it's just an awareness play or it's just the ability for people to, um, uh, get customer service and customer service isn't direct revenue, but it's indirect revenue. But, you know, in, in that sense... If you're early on in your community, I think, development process, think about how you want your money to flow. And if there's a possibility for that money to flow, turn it into reality. Because, you know, if I could have charged $5 a month for everybody in my community, I'd be pulling 120 k a month, and that'd be pretty good. Um, but, you know, I'm making way less than 120 k a month, so... <laughs> You know, and $5 a month for the kind of stuff I put in my group is actually a pretty big steal considering what you get. So, you know, if I were to start over Albert's List again, um, a membership tier probably would be very, very much on top of mind. Thank you. Who else? Um, that was a really nice talk. Thank you. That was really well thought out. Um, so I'm all on board with leaders. You talked about leaders and empowering them. I'm wondering how you track them, especially as you scale. I don't know if Facebook has tools. Some of the platforms do. There's Mobilize that helps empower leaders. Like, How do you manage all these individuals? Yeah, so it's very much on an ad hoc basis um, with anything that happens in our group because once you scale up to a certain size, the noise gets very noisy. Um, we ask that every member that maybe wants to do something that's uh, different come to us community managers individually and uh, talk to us. And so... Um, you know, Mabel in this last post, in, the, in her post, wasn't necessarily uh, too, you know, appropriate in what she did. But, you know, I let her go because she's also a friend of mine. But, you know, on a general basis, I would say that uh, it comes down to, uh, it comes down to enrollment. So um, it's better that you go to them and, uh, and say, hey, I'm looking for a volunteer to do X, Y, and Z. Who's willing to do it? Um, and then, you know, have that turn into a further opportunity down the line as opposed to uh, members doing things ad hoc because that can be a trampling on your brand if they don't know what your brand message is. Yeah, so he's asking, do you keep, it tra keep track of it in a spreadsheet? Do you organize it somehow? Uh, for me, the answer is no. I think for other people, the answer should be yes. Uh, and, and I think that, <laughs> and I think that uh, uh, what, uh, what that comes down to is, um, is keeping in touch, keeping in contact. Um, I'm on Facebook Messenger all day long. Facebook Messenger is, is a godsend because I think it just keeps everything in touch and as organized as it can possibly be. And so when I enroll people, you know, my thing is, look, uh, be accessible through Facebook Messenger. Uh, we'll work on projects together, be able to communicate. And then uh, because, you know, it's all volunteer, I don't want to make it too complicated either. 
So, you know, there are some organizations that work you to the bone as a volunteer. And I don't want to be that kind of person. Um, I want it to make it sort of along the lines of if you're working for Albert's List as a volunteer, that you don't sacrifice your personal, your career life for this. And that you can still get a similar impact out of it if you just want to meet people, uh, if you just want to get to know people. And so... Um, if you want volunteers, I'll help find you other volunteers that can work under you. And it's your job to manage those volunteers. And if anything bad happens, you can loop me in. Um, or, you, or you can go ahead and you know, figure out how it goes. Uh, and if there's money involved, uh, hopefully there's none involved. But if there's money involved, we'll discuss that too. So um, I haven't had that happen quite yet. But uh, I can let you know, because now we're starting events up again. And who knows where that rabbit hole goes. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, if I were to start Albert's List again today, what would I do differently to grow it? Um, you know, so I, uh, I've looked at the Albert's List model over the last couple of years, and it started out as a jobs board, and today, you know, I feel like it's, um, today I feel like it's a uh, Facebook version of Quora for careers, because a lot of people ask a lot of advice, and they want a lot of guidance, and, you know, there's a lot of college students about to leave school, and they're going to be really lost, and we're probably going to get an influx of that in the next couple of months and weeks. Uh, if I were to start it over again, you know, I would probably build a stronger web presence on a website off of Facebook that probably would include a lot more job listings, a lot more immediate connections with a, I think, add-in into Facebook uh, where I would charge for that additional advice at like maybe five bucks a month and give that to people that way so that you can create those multiple streams of income as a uh, sort of lifestyle business because that's what Albert's List is something that I want, to, want it to become. Um, if there's anything else I would do, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. I don't know that I would create a mobile app for it because that would make it too complicated. Um, I don't know that I would go all in on a brand page. That's kind of, well, I probably would because the product structure would be a lot different too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think otherwise, you know, um, really, I think now that I know where Albert's List is, and what the potential is, yes, I would have started it differently. But I think the fact that I began it with the most innocent of intentions to give is, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily second place. Because there's a lot of joy from being able to see people are helped in their career. And I don't think of it as, I don't think of it as having left money on the table. Because relationships are just as valuable. I, um, so in the early days, when you didn't have a lot of members, how did you encourage them to spread the word about Albert's List through word of mouth? That seems to be the biggest growth leverage for you was word of mouth. How do you, how do you uh, facilitate that? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's really like the early carrots were like uh, saying that, you know, we had access to a lot of different networking events. If you want to work for Google, we can give you that. If you want to work for Facebook, we know people there. So there's a lot of talking about different types of connections that we had. And then it was, uh, I guess, uh, I think always knowing that people were uh, here to use Albert's List as an option. I remember now, I think back in 2014, when I was first starting this, uh, in like year one and a half, I think we were at like 3,000 members. I had a really disgruntled person come to me, and they were like, oh yeah, you know, I've tried Albert's List, 
this doesn't work. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go do my own thing. And, and it felt kind of sad at the time because I was like, yeah, I can help you, but you know, whatever. Um, maybe he can come in now three years later when he's got like nine times as many people and he'll get his help. Uh, but you know, I think that a lot early on, you know, it comes down to, it came down to a lot of experimentation and seeing what works. I know nowadays, you know, you have entire, you have growth hackers who talk about how to build your Facebook community from zero to like 10,000 in three days. Um, and you know, there's value in that too. But uh, I think like I said earlier, um, building it slowly is, has been really helpful too. Because uh, as much as having that vanity metric which was, you know, really hot in 2011, was great. Uh, I think having the quality now in 2017 is even better. Um, I'm curious if you track any engagement or activity metrics on your page, and how do you do it? Because I know Facebook Groups doesn't have good analytics tools. So I track member growth manually. And it's actually a real pain in the butt because um, I've actually had volunteers go back to the very beginning of time, day by day, through four years to see how many people join per day. And the numbers don't match up. <laughs> and it's uh, pretty terrible. But I know that there's a couple of uh, really cool tools out there. The one that comes to mind right now is Gritix. Um, and then there was another one. Sorry? A G-R-Y-T-I-C-S. Gritix. And then there's another one, I don't remember the name of it, but uh, that one was really good because I could go in and uh, look at the uh, number of um, the active, like they gave, they gave every user an activity score and uh, they, they kind of measured engagement all the way throughout. And the app seemed to be at that time free, so uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, the unfortunateness of my group though is that it's been around for so long that going all the way back to the beginning of it is pretty hard um, because it's got to load about four years of data. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I mean, I too wish that Facebook would get on their act and uh, transform groups into something more ROI friendly because uh, it's probably the next best thing to a personal profile right now as far as engagement goes because brand pages are practically zero. So, yeah, unless you pay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very helpful. I mean, I learned a ton. So, thank you so much. And, uh,